because Sam Altman invested in my company, um, I was introduced to him by Aubrey, is ChatGPT and its amazing ability to write haikus. So I've, um, I'd like to introduce my talks now with a haiku written by ChatGPT. Uh, this one is about 25 years of human pluripotent stem cell research. And I'll just read it to you. Unlocking life's code, 25 years of promise, stem cells light the path. Now, pluripotent stem cells are not like the other stem cells that might have been mentioned during this, uh, this meeting. Um, they, are, they exist only in cell culture. They aren't in our bodies. Um, they're the only non-cancer cells that continue to proliferate uh, endlessly. And that turns out to be important. They are also able to differentiate into any cell type in the body. And that also turns out to be important. So the two sources of, of pluripotent stem cells are embryonic embryos. Uh, those were first made about exactly 25 years ago. Um, human embryonic stem cells were made from discarded uh, blastocysts uh, from in vitro, uh, in vitro uh, fertilization clinics. And uh, some of those that were made at that point, time point were mine. So I've been in this business for a very long time. The other source, which has been a lot more useful for us, is the um, induced pluripotent stem cells, which were first uh, made in 2006 from mice and then 2007 from, uh, from humans by Shinya Yamanaka and his group. Uh, Shinya won the Nobel Prize for that work in 2012, and I think it's greatly deserved. So let's turn to Parkinson's disease. Oh, I want to remind you, you did have pluripotent stem cells at one point in your life, so don't really feel bad about this. They exist when you were a five-day-old embryo. You had your own pluripotent stem cells. You can have them again, of course, if you reprogram your skin cells to pluripotent stem cells. Parkinson's disease is caused by the loss of dopamine neurons in a particular part of the brain called the uh, substantia nigra. And it results in, in movement problems, um, and it really is due to the lack of dopamine delivery to neurons in the brain. By the time the disease is diagnosed, more than half of the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra, which you can see that little tiny thing um, with the arrow pointing to it, um, more than 50% uh, of those have died. The therapy currently, and for a long time now, that has been used for treating Parkinson's disease is to give people L-DOPA, which is a precursor for dopamine. And it, uh, it can en enhance the ability of the remaining dopamine neurons to make more dopamine. But no, there is no therapy that reverses or stops the progressive uh, degeneration of dopamine neurons. This is not an, a really new concept. Back in the 1980s and through the early 2000s, there were a number of studies done using cell replacement therapy, but instead of stem cells, which had not been made yet, um, fetal tissues were used. And the interesting thing about it is that most of the time, even though it didn't work, these were six to eight, 10 week old fetuses, so they were aborted fetuses, which make, would make it very challenging to re repeat this um, experiment in the US, at least now. Um, <clears throat> but the interesting thing was most of the time it didn't work, but occasionally it worked beautifully. And that gave all of us an incentive and a belief that if you could do this right, then you could, in fact, take, you could actually replace the neurons of, in a Parkinson's disease brain, and the effects could last for 20 years or for the rest of the person's life. Um, I want to point out Kurt Fried there. This is a wonderful book he wrote about his personal experience doing one of these clinical trials um, in Colorado, um, Healing the Brain. Um, there's a good article, actually, in the Wall Street Journal in, in March, which I recommend because it explains what we're doing at Aspen Neuroscience. Um, we take a skin biopsy. We grow fibroblasts from that biopsy. We reprogram them using Sendai virus, which does not integrate into induced pluripotent stem cells. We then um, take those cells and turn them into neurons using a really robust um, differentiation method. One of the easiest things to make from pluripotent stem cells are neurons. 
And to make dopamine neurons, this takes a couple of tweaks. It's very reliable. So why should we use autologous cells? I mean, I told you one of them was the issue of rejection. We don't, it would be better not to have to immunosuppress people. Um, manufacturing is a different challenge, though, because if you're using one cell line, you can actually use bioreactors to grow the cell up, cell line up. If you're doing an autologous therapy, then you have to make the cells from each individual patient. There are different challenges, but they aren't any greater than the challenges of an allogeneic therapy. Um, and one of the challenges, which I'll point out in a minute, of an allogeneic therapy is the high probability of mutations acqu being acquired by the cells as they are scaled up. And since we do not need to scale up the cells, in fact, we only need a few million cells for a treatment, we don't need bioreactors. We can use culture dishes. And interestingly, if we ever do have to redose people, if, they, if they're, these are their own cells, they will be frozen and they can get redosed if the cells don't take the first time. They won't be rejected. I want to talk a little bit about the perils of unlimited cell proliferation. I told you IPS cells or pluripotent stem cells do not um, stop dividing. They will divide forever. And one of the things that happens when a cell divides forever like in a cancer, is that it acquires genetic aberrations, genomic aberrations. We've known for more than a decade that these cells are notoriously bad at staying, keeping genomic integrity over multiple cell passages. And for other cell lines, that may not matter. But for these, it really does matter. This is a, uh, from a paper my lab published uh, almost 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, in which we used genotyping to study a very large number, nearly 200 different uh, pluripotent stem cell lines. And we discovered a lot of duplications, even some of whole chromosomes and certainly small regions of chromosomes. And the reason that they acquire mutations is because there's an evolutionary process going on in the incubator. And what that means, every time a cell divides, it's been estimated that there are five to seven or so mistakes made in the sequence uh, in, in regenerating re, re, um, the DNA. And that's fine because we have a lot of space in our genomes for mutations to occur. But it turns out that if you do this too long, that there will be, there'll start to be selection in the culture dishes. And there's one particular gene that is very highly selected for in pluripotent stem cells, and that's p53 mutations. Those are the same mutations that you find in about half of human cancers. So not a good thing to have in your cells, but um, a few years ago, one of my colleagues at Harvard, uh, Kevin Egan, discovered that many cell banks, even GMP cell banks of, of embryonic stem cells, contained subpopulations, some large subpopulations, that had p53 mutations. So if you don't monitor your cells and you grow up a lot of them, you have to throw out the whole lot. The advantage of growing up just a few cells is a, that we have a fail-fast strategy. I'll show you in a moment. So the idea is for us to monitor the gen genome of these cells um, frequently over time. So when we first make the cells, we do a whole genome sequencing, and we also do SNP genotyping. We use SNP genotyping to identify the person from which those cells came, and also to look for structural variations in the genome. And then we um, do RNA-seq um, to phenotype the cells, to know what they have become or what they are right now. Um, and we do whole genome sequencing again um, when we've selected a, a, a colony that we're going to use for the, uh, and, and grown it up slightly, uh, to use for making the dopamine neurons. And then we do whole genome sequence and SNP genotyping once more before those cells go into the patients. That's the advantage of whole genome sequencing becoming routine and very easy to do, especially in a place like San Diego, which is where Illumina is. Okay, so here's a, a proof, an early proof of concept uh, study that we did. Um, because one of the things that people were worried about was that the cells might not act the same way from different individuals. And this is a demonstration that at least two cell lines act almost exactly the same. Uh, this is the rat model that, that people use for uh, detecting the ability of the cells to uh, re, re in the rat model. 
Um, you kill off all the dopamine neurons in one side of the brain, and then in that side of the brain, you put your human cells. It's immunosuppressed, of course, so they won't reject them. You'll see that if uh, once the rat is lesioned, it starts circling in the, in the direction of the lesion when you give it amphetamine, because that causes massive dopamine release. So a very straightforward, easy to observe uh, animal uh, test. Um, so once, if the cells are taking hold and they are re the brain, then they, the rats will stop circling in a particular direction. They'll start circling equally. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, that's one of our rats that's been uh, cured of, of the lesion we gave it. And the graph shows that these two cell lines that we looked at had almost exactly the same timing of recovery in the rats. So I told you we we're doing RNA sequencing. With the, the purpose of RNA sequencing is to define the phenotype, but also to predict what those cells can do. So the first of these was, was uh, a, an assay called Pluritest, which has been very popular. It's become one of the major um, assays to show that your cells are pluripotent, that is, they can make all three germ layers. And we, um, and we did that by, by setting up a, um, a, a bank of cell lines. We looked at hundreds and hundreds of cell lines that had all been proven to be um, able to make all three germ lines by an assay which is incredibly cumbersome called the teratoma assay. So once we published uh, the pluritest, people did not use that teratoma assay anymore. Um, so you'll see that I've shown the, the pluripotency. There's another stage that is called a specified stage, and this is in differentiation of cells. Then there's a determined stage. At the determined stage, they can only do one thing, but they're not that cell type yet. They've limited their options, but they aren't differentiated. And that turns out to be really important because uh, we needed a, an, a way of, uh, of, uh, of determining whether we had the right cells or not. So we, we took a lesson from Pluritest and we started doing gene expression profiling. We set up a database and we came up with a predictive assay for cells that would be at the right stage for maximum um, ability to, to recover in the brain. And we just published this work um, last month, um, some of it. Um, and what I wanted to point out is there's a sweet spot in the differentiation. And we can define that by gene expression signature. If you keep the cells too long, as we did in this study, we kept them a little bit too long, they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, make neurites and cause recovery in the rats. But if they were at the perfect place, they did that really well. I'll show you another example here. So to define the optimal stage of, for transplantation, we had to define the optimal stage of differentiation. And there are no markers for a determined state. It's something that is predicting what's going to happen in the future. It's not a thing in itself. So what we discovered was that if we had the cells in this effective range, they would grow neurites after they were transplanted, which makes sense, and they recovered, the rats recovered. The cells that were a little bit past that stage also engrafted really well. There was no difference in the grafts. There were just as many dopamine neurons at the end of the experiment in both of those time points, but they wouldn't make neurites. They wouldn't respond to the environment in which they've been transplanted and make synapses with the host. So we have narrowed it down to some really interesting candidates that may be responsible for that. One of them is this uh, transcription Trans transcriptional repressor called REST, which seems to be very um, uh, ubiquitous in, uh, in, the, uh, in development. And we found that there were, in this example, we found that there were 35 genes that are associated, that are repressed by the REST transcription factor that are not detectable at the effective stage and become detectable at the ineffective stage. In other words, the neurons have to be, or the, the neurons to be, have to be poised. They have to be uh, holding off on growing neurites until they actually get into the brain. Um, okay, so uh, progress in trials. There are already three, Kyoto, um, Lund University in Sweden, and uh, Blue Rock Therapeutics have all begun their allogeneic trials. 
And the, the big news for me is that we have been approved for our first phase one trial, um, a phase one slash 2B trial. We were approved about 10 days ago. Uh, so we'll, we'll be... St <laughs> so we'll be starting that trial before the end of the year. And we'll find out. Um, at clinical trials, an experiment you do in humans. <laughs>